Three men died that day on the hillside just outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem. It was near the Damascus Gate, a major entry and exit way in and out of the city. It was one of the favorite places for Roman soldiers to crucify criminals because of the large crowds that would pass by and see the death hanging on a tree. This day, this Friday was, was unique. It was unlike any other Friday that had ever come before, and it was unlike any other Friday that has ever come since. Maybe that's part of the reason why we call it Good Friday. It was anything but good to those assembled there that day, especially for those three men. We know the one main character was none other than the Lord Jesus himself, who leading up to this point of crucifixion, his day began actually the evening before as he went to the garden and there poured out his heart in anguish for what the Father had asked him to do. But he willingly went. While there in prayer, he was bothered by the oncoming of a crowd of soldiers, led by none other than Judas, one of his inner circle. The betrayal was the sign of a kiss. From that moment on, up until the next day when Jesus was crucified on that cross outside of the walls of Jerusalem, he went through mock trial after mock trial. He endured blasphemy. He endured beating, ridicule, being spat upon, lied about. The very hairs of his beard were yanked from his face. He was mocked as a crown of thorns was thrust upon his skull. He was put in a robe of royalty, not because they thought he was deserving of it, but to make fun of him. So he was already exhausted before the day even began. After the extensive beatings and floggings, he, he was called upon to carry his own cross from the judgment hall to Golgotha, being absolutely whipped in a very real way. He was almost to the point of death, but not there yet. Under the weight of the cross, he fell down on numerous occasions. And so the soldiers, instead of beating him more, called for a bystander. His name was Simon, who was only in town to celebrate the fast, uh, Passover celebration. They called on him to carry his cross as he followed Jesus up that hill. The crowd was intense. They were yelling all kinds of blasphemy. There was wailing of tears of those who loved him and knew him best, thought this can't be. Although he had predicted it would come to this, he also promised them that on three days later, he would rise again from the dead. As he led the way to Golgotha, the cross beam was laid on the ground. He was forced to lay down upon it, stripped totally naked before the world. And then we hear the nails and the hammer as they meet, one through one hand, another through the other hand. His feet were placed on top of each other, and one spike drove through both of them. The cross was then lifted up, dropped into a hole in the ground, and it hit with a resounding thump. But then there were two others that day, one on his right hand and one on his left. We don't really know too much about these two individuals. As a matter of fact, we don't know their name. We don't know where they came from. We don't know what their educational status was. All we really do know is that they were guilty of the crimes that they had committed. The, the writers of Holy Scripture, they use terms like robbers, Thieves, malefactors, troublemakers, thugs. Some even believe these two individuals were perhaps brothers. We don't know. But certainly, they were criminals that were paying for their sin. Uh, some even thought they may have been political terrorists who were uh, hell-bent on overthrowing the Roman rule of that day. Again, we don't know much about them. But we do know this. They were both bloodied and beaten and battered as they carried their crosses that day to Calvary's Hill.
They, too, were laid upon those crosses. The nail hit the spikes as each one was impaled to a tree. They, too, were lifted up and dropped into the ground. The writers of Scripture tell us that both of them began to mock Jesus. As a matter of fact, one of them was so brazen as to say, if you are the Christ, why don't you get yourself down and take us with you? He he made a request that day, as did the other a little bit later on. But the first one's request was for an escape, not for forgiveness. Later in that day, the other thief, he would make a request for forgiveness and not for escape. Uh, over the course of the day, the thing that set these two guys apart was not the way they looked. It was not their past. It wasn't their record. The thing that set them apart was the way that they looked at the man in the middle, the man, Jesus. The, uh, we pick up the story in Luke's gospel, chapter 23, verse 32 says this, Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right hand and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, he is the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving due reward for our deeds. But this man, this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he, Jesus, said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Both of those criminals woke up that day in guilt. They were guilty of the crimes that they had been found guilty of. But one of those men, throughout the course of the day, began to see Jesus differently. He began to see those who had gathered around and were weeping with tears of loss. He began to hear the voice of those who began to see Jesus for who he really was. And he began to see Jesus the King of kings and Lord of lords, who looked anything but kingly and lordly that day. After all, he was impaled to a tree. His body was beaten and bruised and battered and bloodied. He was naked and exposed to all the world to see. He had a crown of thorns on his head. But what that man saw that day was not a crown of thorns, but he saw a crown of glory. And he prayed a very simple in a very succinct prayer. He said, Lord, remember me. Remember me. And then the way that Jesus answered that prayer was truly amazing. Because he said this, he said, in our English Bible, it says, truly I say to, to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, in the original writing, when Jesus said that sentence, he began with the word today. And that was to emphasize the fact that today, this day, your last day of this life, your first day in eternity is today. Today you will be with me. Think about that promise that he gave him there on the cross. He said, you will be with me. You will not be around somewhere near me. You will be literally, the trans, the, the translation is, you will be side by side that where I am, there you will be with me in paradise. 
So we see that, that he had a prompt salvation today. He had a personal salvation. You will be with me. He had a heavenly salvation in paradise. And wherever Jesus is, that's heaven. And that was true. So this man who woke up and began his day in guilt encountered grace. But not only did he encounter grace hanging on a tree, literally he embraced grace. And that grace that he embraced led him to the moment that he took his last breath to step across the threshold from this life into eternity with Jesus. Now think about that with me for a second. That was the very best Friday there could ever have been for this man. And we think to ourselves, how? How in the world could Jesus save a man who, who, who lived an entire life, as far as we know, doing wrong and sinning? Everything that he did was, was selfish and self-centered. And he admitted to as much when he, when he spoke to his friend across the way. But yet... Something changed. And what changed was is he saw his sin for what it was. And Jesus extended the grace to him. Uh, some of us, we want to think to ourselves, well, you know what, to be quite honest with you, I, I, uh, I don't know about uh, deathbed conversions and I don't know about this, but this was truly the most amazing conversion we see in all of the scriptures. You see, Think about this with me for a second. This man, as far as we know, no, never had any contact with Jesus. He never heard any of the messages that Jesus preached. He never saw any of the miracles that Jesus performed. He never even knew Lazarus, who just a couple of weeks earlier, a week or so earlier, had been raised from the dead. He never got to, uh, to know the Old Testament scriptures that predicted Jesus' coming. And yet here he saw Jesus for who he was. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Redeemer of all mankind. Well, what does this man's story teach us? I think it teaches us a couple things. Number one, it's never too late to come to Jesus. It's never too late. Now, I wouldn't recommend you wait until the very last second like he did to come to faith in Jesus. And to be honest with you, the more you hear about the fact that God loves you, he's got a purpose and a plan for your life, that Jesus died on the cross as a substitutionary death, as payment for your sins, the more you hear that and do not respond to it, the harder your heart will become. And there will come a day where you won't be able to respond because you will have rejected it so many times. This guy, he heard the message, saw the message one time, and he responded. So it's never too late to come to faith in Jesus. But secondly, no matter who you are, no matter what you have done, no matter what your past says, you too can know Jesus as your real and personal Savior. There is nothing that you have ever done that could keep you from falling under the umbrella of God's love. Think about that. Absolutely, positively nothing. I talk to people all the time and they say, well, you don't know my past. You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know the things I've said, the how I've treated people. You're right, I don't. But there is one who does. And that was the very reason why Jesus died on the cross that good Friday. He took upon himself that day all of the sin of all mankind for all of time. And he paid that price so that you and I, so that you and I could have the forgiveness of our sins, that we could have eternal and abundant life. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28, Jesus said, I, the Son of Man didn't come to serve or to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. He paid a debt that he did not owe because you and I owed a debt that we could not ever pay. 
And that really wrestle, uh, that, that rubs us wrong, doesn't it? I mean, we think of passages of Scripture like Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It says, For by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one could boast. If there was ever a guy who didn't do anything to earn his way to heaven, it was that man on the cross that day. But it was just simply proving a biblical truth and principle to you and to me. There is nothing we can do left on our own to please and pardon our own sin. No matter how hard we work, no matter how hard we try, no matter how much scripture we would memorize, no matter how many times you would be baptized, no matter how many times you would take communion, how many times you would go to confession, there is nothing you can do on your own. It is all by grace. You see, this man woke up in guilt. He encountered grace and he embraced grace and he experienced glory glory. Today, this day, you will be with me in paradise. What made Good Friday Good Friday was the fact that that salvation is available to you and to me. Not because of who we are or because of what we have done, As a matter of fact, it's in spite of who we are and in spite of what we have done. But it's because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a perfect and a sinless life, died a substitutionary and atoning death on Calvary's cross, sufficing God's holiness to wipe out our record of sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He paid that debt, but as we celebrate on Easter Sunday, he didn't stay in the grave. Aren't you glad that he only borrowed the grave? Just three days, and he was out. And he did that because of his love for you and his love for me. When I read the story of the thief on the cross, I see two men. One who totally rejected grace as he looked it in the eyes, and yet one who totally accepted that grace, and God granted it to him. Why not today? Why don't you today accept that free gift of salvation? You say, Hutch, how do I do that? I don't know. You simply pour out your heart to God. You you acknowledge your sin. You say, Jesus, I am a sinner And I know that my sin has separated me from you. But I believe you are who you said you are. That you are the perfect, sinless, substitutionary son of God. That you died in my place. That if I will simply transfer all of my guilt and accept all of your forgiveness, you will change me. So today I confess my sin, that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I confess that you are a Savior and I invite you to come into my life. There's nothing magical about this prayer, but I want to lead you in a prayer. And if this prayer expresses a sincere sincere desire of your heart, I want you to know that all of heaven rejoices. Literally, a party is being thrown in heaven in honor of you. Would you join me? Would you pray a prayer something like this just between you and Jesus? Would you say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on Calvary's cross as payment for my sin." Although I don't fully understand it all right now, as best I know how, I invite you, Lord Jesus, come into my life, forgive me of my sin, and begin to make me the kind of person you want me to be. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing and answering my prayer. Friend, if you pray that prayer with me, I want you to know that all of heaven is rejoicing in honor of you. And I want to encourage you, get into this book. Get into the Word of God. Get into your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, let us know at One Thing for Men. We'll do everything we can to get a Bible to you because we want to see you grow in your personal walk of faith. Our mission at One Thing for Men is to spur men on to walk with God. And now that you know Him as your real and personal Savior, we want to encourage you. We want to equip you. We want to walk alongside of you and give you everything that we possibly can to help you to be all that God wants for you to be. This truly is a very good Friday.